It feels as if eclipse season only just happened. Last year's autumn eclipses unleashed a hurricane of controversy and violence that unfortunately still hasn't abated. But time is flying, the world is changing terrifyingly quickly, and eclipse season is already here once again. March will see a second eclipse in the sign of Libra. And so the portals of change are once again opening, potentially initiating fresh chapters of stories that began back in October 2023. But eclipses aside, this will be a month marked by the heavy influence of Pisces, the sign marking the end of the story of the Zodiac, and one that concerns the surrender of the self and the return to source. And so March looks like a month to imagine, create, and tend to the spiritual. You want to use this time wisely because April looks like the most astrologically dynamic month of the year. And in this forecast episode, we'll explain how to surf the waves of change in March to make sure you're ready for whatever April has in store. As ever, I'll be joined by SJ Anderson and Steph Koifman for another concise lowdown on the month's astrology that will clue you in to what's coming both for you individually and for the wider world. But before we get into what's coming this month, Let's make our customary review of the previous month's events. First, a quick disclaimer. In this review section, we're just highlighting a few examples of moments where the astrology described world events most vividly. We aren't pretending this is a balanced picture of the world situation, nor does it imply that these are the most important things that happened over the last month. The point is really just to say, astrology works, and here's the evidence. Now, as we predicted, Aquarian archetypes were all over the major events of late January and February. For example, there were huge developments and controversies around new technology. On January 29, just a week after uh, Pluto ingressed into Aquarius, Elon Musk's Neuralink implanted a brain chip into a human for the first time. So there's not a lot else that we really know at the moment, right? Like what does success mean in this case? Was this done safely? Is this something that could potentially restore mobility to paralyzed patients or sight to the blind as the company claims to want to do. But this does feel like it could be an omen of where our cyborg future is headed for better or for worse. Tucker Carlson traveled to Moscow to interview Vladimir Putin. Regardless of what you think of either man, this story was highly Aquarian. Aquarius has to do with the theme of the outsider. And outsiders aren't always the people on your side or even characters you find sympathetic. This is a kind of Pluto and Aquarian coup for uh, independent media. Tucker being completely independent in a way and releasing on social media platforms rather than connected to a formal institution of traditional media. So we may see more decentralized, which is often a key word for Aquarius, but decentralized media structure Anybody can be a journalist in our day and age. Also pretty shortly after the Pluto ingress, AI-generated porn was in the news. This was a pretty foreseeable outcome of what deepfake technology would be used for, and it's already being used against women and girls. Taylor Swift was the most high-profile victim of deepfake porn around the time of the Leo full moon. So that Leo full moon was opposing Pluto a couple days after its ingress into Aquarius. So we saw the full moon revealing this novel Plutonian potential in the sign of Leo, which is the sign of the entertainer and the celebrity. Maybe the biggest thing in February is the Apple Vision Pro. All of those images disseminating over social media as that VR headset was released to the public. People are walking around the streets moving their uh, icons, that only they can see in their headset. It's very tripped out and very Saturn and Pisces. What is real? What are the boundaries of reality? I think the Apple Vision Pro headset is very much both Saturn and Pisces, but then it's Pluto and Aquarius, new tech, new innovative tech coming online. So that's a very interesting story that combines those two transits, I think, very well. In early February, we saw huge protests by farmers creating disruption across Europe. Well, this was clearly indicated by the sign-based square between Pluto in Aquarius and Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus. Pluto in Aquarius has to do with the empowerment of those at the margins. And in these technocratic metropolitan times, people who work the land are, I think it's fair to say, relatively marginalized. It's interesting to note that Aquarius is one of Saturn's signs. And Saturn was the planet that traditionally represented the land and agricultural workers. We saw King Charles diagnosed with cancer when Pluto 
was in that first degree of Aquarius. Of course, the Pluto and Aquarius stories have often been about the King of England. You had uh, King George and the American Revolution against King George back in the 18th century. You had King Henry and his wives and the break from the Catholic Church back in the 16th century. So this has been on the bingo card for Pluto and Aquarius. Look for the King of England or the Royal House of England and changes there. There's talk of William's inauguration maybe coming during the Pluto and Aquarius which would kind of be a revolution in terms of youth taking over that institution. With that recap out the way, let's head into March, which begins with Mercury, the messenger, swimming in deep waters. If you're enjoying this video, please do give it a like. And if you're finding our work useful, why not hit the subscribe button and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Mercury will spend the first 10 days or so in the watery, boundaryless realm of Pisces, a sign in which it's seen as debilitated. March has three distinct phases, and the first 10 days is kind of like the Mercury confusion arc. So we come into the month with Mercury severely debilitated. In its fall, combust the sun, separating from a conjunction to Saturn, applying to Neptune. So don't expect much to make sense in early March. Don't expect to be understood. Don't expect your GPS to work when you need it to. Do expect to have to rely on your other senses, on your intuition, on alternative forms of intelligence to navigate things in a non-linear way. To be clear, there are lots of wonderful things about Mercury in Pisces. It's poetic, it's visionary, it sees connections that others miss. We have a tremendous Mercury in Pisces communicator on this very show. But by transit, when it comes to crossing the T's and dotting the I's and lowercase j's, Mercury in Pisces can struggle. This will be a time to write poems, not instructional manuals. But on March the 10th, Mercury will enter the martial sign of Aries. And a few days later, on March the 15th, Mercury will have moved 15 degrees away from the sun. And so according to Hellenistic rules, it will have moved out of the sun's beams. When the messenger emerges from the beams, it has something to say, and it will be speaking from the fast moving martial domain of Aries. Mercury's ingress into Aries is a shot of quick, hot, fast relief. It's like the heat drying up the water that's been weighing down Mercury's wings. So it's this incoherent, confused, creative Mercury that then will shift as Mercury comes into Aries here in March into one where force, power, and clarity of movement are much more a part of the Mercury story. Mercury in Aries is quick direct and fast. It makes the straightest beeline to its destination, unlike Mercury in Pisces, which tends to circumambulate a little bit. Mercury in Aries is economical with its words. It manages to say a lot with very little, right? This is in contrast to Mercury in Pisces, which is evocative. It describes the shadow of the thing it's describing without directly naming it. Just in general with Mercury and Aries, words can become swift, they can become like arrows. So this is the kind of tendency with Mercury and Aries, swift piercing and sometimes aimed with intent to trigger. So you might wanna also be careful here, especially because these initial Mercury and Aries strategies, second half of March, uh, will be reviewed and tested as Mercury stations retrograde on the 1st of April, and then April is all about Mercury reviewing degrees in Aries. On March the 19th, Mercury reaches 15 degrees and 58 minutes of Aries, and so enters what astrologers call shadow. And this has to do with Mercury's retrograde cycle, because on April the 1st, Mercury will station retrograde. On April the 25th, it will station direct at 15 degrees and 58 minutes of Aries. And so when Mercury reaches that exact point in the Zodiac on March the 19th, it will enter territory that it will later have to retread. This is known as entering shadow. And so from this moment, we can expect that the pieces of the story of April's retrograde will start to be put in place. So you definitely want to know that as you're deploying mercurial energies here in March, that there's a long review process and a reconfiguration that April brings. And the other thing I'll just say about uh, Mercury and Aries is that whatever we're writing and thinking and speaking and analyzing in March after Mercury enters Aries, these are words that are also involved in the eclipse story because Mercury will be in Aries for that solar eclipse on 8 April. And so very much pay attention to what mercurial moments you're experiencing here in March leading up to that eclipse because they very well may be part of the eclipse story. You write a letter, you send texts, you write emails, 
those are now all the fuel or the clay for how that eclipse will change reality. So be watchful. In terms of the mundane with Mercury in Aries, you know, there's several wars happening now. War in Ukraine, war in Palestine, Israel. And this could mean propaganda strategies get more bellicose. The words of war, the piercing words of war, more threats, more ultimatums. You know, you may want to be prepared for the war conversations becoming more centered in the collective discourse. But even though Mercury will be leaving Pisces quite early in the month, it won't be the only planet in the sign of the fishes in March. On March the 10th, we'll see a new moon at 20 degrees and 16 minutes of Pisces. Once again, this new moon is in a tight aspect to disruptive, freedom-seeking Uranus, this time a sextile. Every new moon since November has closely aspected Uranus, so it's no surprise that since that time it's very much felt like the times are changing and quickly. So this Pisces new moon is a kickoff to the Pisces theme that dominates the month because you'll have two Pisces stelliums this month. You'll have Saturn, Mercury, and the Sun all in Pisces together. And then you'll have Saturn, Mars, and Venus in Pisces together, which means all traditional planets except for Jupiter spend time in Pisces during this month. It really is a month dominated by the Piscean, the dreamy, surreal, spiritual Piscean energy truth-seeking and creative Piscean, all of those keywords could dominate here in March. Pisces is the water home of Jupiter, uh, and this makes me think about the difference between Jupiter as water and Jupiter as fire. It's the difference between a preacher who delivers a fiery sermon and Buddha who holds up a flower in silence, right? The wisdom is received, it's not externalized. You know, Pisces is the dreamscape, and these inner worlds are where we create the outer. There's often inner releases and breakthroughs that once they happen, you've probably all experienced this. You have some cathartic release, a, a good cry, or some kind of moment in therapy, and then you leave that energy and the whole world's different. People look at you differently just from some internal moment of release. This is the Piscean. This new moon is taking place in Pisces 3, the last of the 36 decans, the 10 degree divisions of the zodiac, each of which is associated with its own images and mythology. As the last of the Deccans, this Deccan has to do with chasing mad dreams or that happily ever after ending. It's syncretized with the tarot card, the Ten of Cups, which shows such a scene. And so this Deccan is about endings, and this new moon, which is happening close to Neptune, may also stimulate the somewhat unhinged climate of apocalypticism that's permeating the zeitgeist right now. This will be a month to make sure you're taking care of yourself, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I think it's a core theme of March is working with our inner realm so that we can prepare for the outer realm changes that are emerging with cardinal eclipses and masculine signs, Aries and Libra. Pisces is also the only sign where both benefics, Venus and Jupiter, experience a condition of elevation. So there's this aspect of Pisces that's about universal love and acceptance, about being loved universally and loving universally, and sometimes even the problems that can come with that. But in March, we have a collection of planets in Pisces, and they're in the room with Saturn. It's kind of like, where are we coming up against the obstacles and the limitations to being in this receptive state of grace that Pisces seems to demand? What is the rigor and the discipline that's involved in staying open and staying empathetic? You know, love is an action, it's a choice, and sometimes there's this core of resilience that it needs to stem from if it's going to endure. We can see on the astro map that this new moon, which of course will be visible only as a kind of absence, will be culminating over Russia and the Middle East and more precisely, Yemen and the Gulf of Aden. And so the month following this moon is likely to see more disruptive developments in this part of the world, a region in which we may be seeing the first stirrings of what increasingly looks to me like a kind of holy war. Remember, Pisces is a sign of faith, among other things. And I think Dune 2 is the perfect movie here because Dune 2 will be released by this time. New Moon in Pisces. And the novel came out when Saturn was in Pisces in 1965. So Dune is very much a Piscean and a Saturn and Pisces creation. So it's very much about the seriousness and the heaviness of hierarchies of religion and how that motivates groups and the structures of beliefs and prophecy coming true. All of those Saturn and Pisces themes and Neptune and Pisces themes and really Jupiter themes as the ruler of Pisces, fervor around belief. That said, it's not all bad news in Pisces in March. Help will be on the way, 
in the form of the Signs Exaltation Ruler, Venus. On March the 11th, Venus enters Pisces, the sign in which Venus is in the condition of essential dignity, known as exaltation. This empowers Venus significantly, although she will likely need those powers given the house guests she already has in Pisces, Saturn and Neptune, and from March the 22nd, Mars. The middle part of March is more or less defined by exalted Venus getting body checked by Saturn. So this is really when all that stuff we talked about earlier, the challenge of maintaining an open heart and the rigor of love come into focus. Hard Venus-Saturn aspects tend to subjectively not be that fun. It's the metaphysical equivalent of a bad hair day. We're not feeling cute, we're not feeling open, we're not really enjoying things as much as we'd like to be. We might be in a state of rejecting and feeling rejected, but you know there are ways that today's no can definitely more clearly define tomorrow's yes. Venus is exalted in Pisces. It'll be with Saturn in Pisces. And that blend, Venus with Saturn and then Venus with Mars, kind of defines the transit. And so it's on the one hand a Venus under pressure, but on the other hand, it has the powers to deliver and augment and take on the pressures that I think it'll be assigned here during its stint. And I think love is the theme. This is really the time when love will be needed. I mean, that's a trite, glib, sometimes cliche word. But when you pause and really contemplate its full ramifications, it's the most powerful force in reality. There's this notion of releasing into love. You know, breakups, you gotta release the ex into love and just move on. Love yourself, love the past, forgive. All of those themes are strong here and will be very much needed. You know, a malefic conjunction or co-presence is really about survival, surviving the challenge and the kind of edge that life can bring at times, the elbows that life throws at us. I mean this in the most profound way where you cry and grieve and go into the pain, but you meet it with love. It's like a salve that can help us heal. We're gonna need that. I think that will be very much part of the eclipse season, especially the first eclipse where Venus is in Pisces, and be very much a part of that Saturn-Mars story as they get closer and Venus is in the mix. Previous transits of Saturn in Pisces include the mid-60s and the mid-90s, both periods of incredible creativity. Saturn makes things a little difficult for Venus here, but Venus also softens old Saturn up. And so I think this period may see the release of some truly enduring creative works. If you're a creative person yourself, even in the most humble of ways, it will be a good time to put effort into your art. The results will likely be well worth the struggle. And now for something completely different, because on the 20th of March comes the new year, the astrological new year. On March the 20th, the sun enters the sign of Aries. This is the beginning of Aries season. Aries is the sign in which the sun itself is exalted and thus more powerful than usual. The sun in Aries is a really great teacher of personal sovereignty and what it means to stand in your authority. The sun is part of a greater ecosystem, right? A solar system. But authority and sovereignty is when various aspects of your life are constellated around your authentic expression of selfhood. One of the best Aries traits is that there's a lot of honesty in how simple, straightforward, and direct its expression is. Aries isn't trying to hide anything, you know? What you see is what you get. You might not like what you see, you might not like what you get, and that's okay. That, to me, is a teaching on sovereignty. Some of us could really stand to benefit from having a little more audacity, and Aries season is a really great time to push past your own timidity. But the entrance of the sun into Aries also marks the moment of the spring equinox, when the balance between light and darkness shifts. In the Northern Hemisphere, we enter the half of the year in which light predominates over darkness. And so this is a time associated with birth and new beginnings. So the astrological new year comes here in March, the Aries ingress on the 20th. It's the time when astrologers celebrate, you know, International Astrology Day, I think they call it. Various cultures have used this to start the year. That's their starting point, not uh, January 1st. So there really will be a sense of fresh beginnings. Traditional astrologers had specific ways of prognosticating on how the coming year would go. They would cast a chart for the exact moment the sun entered Aries to forecast the nature of the year. And of course, they cast that chart for a particular place. So the Aries ingress chart will always be different for different parts of the world, reflecting the reality that, as with individuals, 
the fortune of nations differs each year. That said, the sign placements and aspects between the planets will be the same regardless of the location, so there are also general comments that we can make. The Aries ingress means some of the astrology we've already talked about in this episode will be baked into the year. So in the chart, no matter the location you pick, the striking feature is the Jupiter-Venus mutual reception. And Jupiter and Venus, Venus and Pisces, Jupiter and Taurus, they actually bonify by a benefic enclosure, they bonify Saturn and Pisces. And so that is going to be all over the world. And every location will get this beautiful Saturn and Pisces with Venus and Pisces and the bonification of Saturn. I expect this year, because of this, configuration to be more creative expansions, more new frontiers of reality get discovered as technology continues to advance at a rapid pace. We'll have real-time uh, language translation apps. Those will accelerate. I mean, I can't imagine how fast that technology is going to move in a year from now what it may be like, where you don't even need to do anything. You just talk and then Everything's just translated without me even having to need an app or anything. It's done on the back end on YouTube. You just click a button and you can listen to it in whatever language you want. I also wonder about the symbolism of Venus, which can speak to things of value. Conjoining Saturn, planet of blockages and limits in the sign of universal flow, Pisces. The chart may be speaking to problems with global trade particularly trade via the oceans. The other thing in this chart I find striking is that there's a luminary fire trine. It's close but separating, but the sun and moon are darn close to each other. I think it's a few degrees away. The moon is separating in early Leo. And I think this brings some kind of inflamed passion this year. And so to have them both in such a flowing configuration of fire, it really does invite us to kind of get excited and passionate this year. Lust for life. On March the 22nd, Mars enters Pisces. This is significant because in April, Mars will conjoin Saturn in that sign, forming a conjunction that happens every two years and is traditionally seen as signifying cycles of misfortune in mundane matters. And while conjoined with Saturn, Mars will rule the Aries solar eclipse of April the 8th that will be visible over the eastern part of the United States. We'll go more deeply into that astrology in the next forecast, but it's worth mentioning here because we'll likely start to see events that set it up falling into place. Mars in Pisces is a highly devotional Mars. It's dedicated to what it's doing, not just in action, but in spirit. It's often roused to anger through empathy for the suffering of other people. So the transition from Mars in Aquarius to Mars in Pisces is one of tactical to spiritual warfare. Mars in Pisces takes action using cunning methods, sometimes by manipulating perceptions of reality itself. And given Pisces' artistic leanings, this is a Mars that would be more inclined to create and influence than take action or attack using more traditionally martial methods. My image for Mars, or one that I love, is that sword that's a flame. Mars is a planet of fire, it's a planet of weapons. What's so beautiful about Mars and Pisces is that flaming sword is submerged in the water, so it may still be warm, but it isn't as dangerous. And so, just to put that plainly, in some kind of practical terms, you know, all the actions you're wanting to take, all of the tools, the sense of urgency may be softened here. Pisces is also the inner realms of selfhood. And so there's a real opportunity to explore motivations for action, for releasing past pain and forgiving, right? Forgiveness is that wonderful container for healing and releasing the past. It really does open up new ways forward. Sometimes without forgiving, we're locked in to the past. It haunts us and it contains us. So look for opportunities to forgive your wounds. The Mars ingress is also significant because it begins the story arc of the Mars-Saturn conjunction that's going to be so much a part of the Aries eclipse in April. So as we talked about in our 2024 year ahead video, that Mars-Saturn conjunction is probably going to be when the biggest challenges of the Saturn and Pisces era are going to come home. Given the way that the Aries eclipse is visible over the western part of Mexico and the eastern coast of the U.S., I could see the potential for flooding affecting the Pacific coast of Mexico and the U.S.'s eastern seaboard. We'll get into this more in April's forecast, but pay attention to what this Mars ingress announces to you, because it could be pointing to where the new trouble is going to land. You know, with Mars and Pisces, we have to consider the paint-by-numbers Astro 101 delineation, war, which is Mars, at sea, which is Pisces, 
and Saturn is C2. And so war at sea. We've got the Straits near Yemen still in play. We've got the Taiwan Strait still in play. I just saw another story about Taiwan today, and they're saying there was drones or you know there was an invasion of that space. Cruise ships, I wouldn't be taking a cruise. This is not the time to be doing high-risk behavior on water, lakes, seas, rivers. Just stay away from that stuff until Mars can clear Saturn and then uh, leave Pisces. We're already seeing what looks like could be the beginnings of a kind of holy war in the Middle East right now. With Mars in Pisces, we could see further outbreaks of violence committed in the name of faith. The theme of migration is another hot topic, one that's at the heart of political divisions in many parts of the world right now. Mars is a hot and dry planet by temperament, and it brings heat and thus action and contention wherever you find it. And so look for controversies and problems related to migration or the flow of goods and capital coming more into view following that ingress. But this month has saved its most potentially dramatic configuration until last, because the end of March will see the beginning of eclipse season. On March the 25th, eclipse season arrives with a lunar eclipse at five degrees of Libra. This initiates a new eclipse season, even though it honestly feels to us like the last one only just happened. This is the second of three eclipses in the Libra eclipse cycle this round. That would be one of my main messages is just feel into the cycle of eclipses because that's often how to do eclipse work best in my opinion is to track these windows of activation in a house topic in your nativity. And I think you might find some clear events from middle to late last year that are directly connected to your Libra sector that now you get another uh, dose here or another offering to move with these faded alterations or these accelerated changes that eclipses can bring. The lunar eclipse in Libra is the biggest story of March. And there's an interesting story being told here with Venus, the ruler of the eclipse. So in October, Venus was in its fall in Virgo, separating from an opposition to Saturn. In March, uh, Venus is exalted in Pisces, also separating from a recent aspect to Saturn. And so we're talking about this exalted Venus ruling the eclipse in the sixth sign from Libra, meaning creative healing, our health, prioritizing Venus for health. These are things like art therapy, making art with friends. You know, during an eclipse season, this can be essential as life is going crazy, synchronicities everywhere, really intense literal astrology. Who are the friends you can be with to even share? I mean, that would be a Piscean, sharing with people to heal. The last eclipse in Libra corresponded to an unraveling of diplomatic ties, both politically and interpersonally. And I don't know if you can recall, but I feel like there is this spirit of bad faith and distrust in the atmosphere. We might see more developments of a similar nature with this eclipse, except this time we might be letting some relationships go out of a spirit of love and generosity, or simply letting relationships take a different form instead of trying to cling to what it was. This is definitely a conscious uncoupling type of eclipse. You know, Libra has such a heady, serious, and anal retentive nature. It can often be that, that sign where it's like everything has to be held so tightly and no one can be angry and it's, taking on the problems of a group and trying to make sure everybody's happy, this can be kind of a darker side of Libra. So as the eclipse comes, maybe some of that gets out of control and our Libran is gonna have to release this mental prison sometimes that it can be about or this people-pleasing energy. And we might need to loosen that grip, lighten up um, and get real and honest. I mean, this is Venus and Pisces with the malefics there. And that's the only way to move a relationship into a new level of intimacy. Sometimes it's to disclose the difficulty and talk about the pain. I think that'll be a big theme of this eclipse moment, for sure. This fresh Libra eclipse will be culminating over the United States and Mexico. And it seems likely to me that we could see further legal rulings or rebalancing and disruption around the ongoing migration and border issues. The first Libra eclipse happened in October and coincided with the shattering of balance in Israel-Palestine which has led to dreadful violence there and spiraling consequences around the Middle East. It's also had serious ramifications for the United States where the eclipse was visible. Now we have another eclipse in Libra and so often with relationships and conflicts and situations, they can surf eclipses, meaning they begin with an eclipse, end with eclipse. 
And so I'm very interested what will happen with Palestine and Israel. We hope so much that the war ends and that there's a negotiated settlement of some kind and that relief can be had for all of the suffering that's happening right now. So that's what I'm wishing for, that this eclipse eclipses out. So that's it for this forecast episode. I'm currently taking some time off consultations, but I have some new goodies coming in the pipeline pretty soon. But Steph and SJ are available for bookings. As usual, I'm available for needle chart readings, year ahead forecasting, student sessions, general consultations, and progressed moon histories. So at the time of this recording, I have about seven spots left for March. I'm sure that by the time this video goes live, I'll, start, I'll be starting to book for April. I hope to see you soon. All right, I wish you all a great March. Have a wonderful eclipse season. Remember to stay spiritual. You might want to turn down life, pray, connect with your divinity, get existential. You can follow me, sjanderson144.com. Go to my website. My reading schedule is there. My YouTube, I'm uploading videos, trying to keep consistent with that. So just check out my YouTube channel. Like and subscribe, comment. I try to answer those comments uh, when I can. Follow me on X Twitter. I'm always there tweeting and engaging. So talk to you all soon. Thank you, Dan and Steph. Have a wonderful, wonderful March and peace. If you're interested in what we've said in this episode about Saturn in Pisces, then I suggest you watch this video from last year, in which I was joined by astrologer Mo, aka Austral Tour, and we dove into what we thought Saturn in Pisces was likely to bring to the world since March last year when it entered that sign and 2026. Thanks for joining us once again. Stay safe and see you next time. <laughs>